Fantastic. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Anna Kipnis, and I work as a senior gameplay programmer at Double Fine Productions. Um, today, I'll be speaking to you about dialogue systems in Double Fine games. So I want to first tell you about my earliest experiences that I had implementing dialogue. Um, I started working at Double Fine in November of 2002 on Psychonauts. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So one of the first things I got to work on in the game was this guy, Boyd Cooper. Now, Boyd is an inmate of the insane asylum that you get to travel to in the course of the game. He's paranoid, he's fond of conspiracy theories, and he likes to mutter to himself as he tries to kind of fit it all together. Um, I was responsible for Boyd's behaviors and reactions, and eventually the gameplay work in his mental world level. Uh, Tim Schafer, the creator of Psychonauts and many other excellent games, had a really cool idea for Boyd's dialogue uh, that would play during his idle behavior. He wanted Boyd to rant constantly, but have the dialogue be dynamically generated from fragments of sentences, um, so that you, get, you, you could listen to him for a while and, he, and hear a different sentence each time. And what you see there is a document he gave me with fragments of lines, which I was to use to kind of construct his muttering. Um, this is what it looked like in the game. The national park system in conjunction with the cows. <laughs> no, no, wait, I mean, yeah, yeah, the tuna canneries. Oh, oh. I pretty much control everything. So how is this done? Well, um, what you see there is a state machine diagram and that it describes on uh, how uh, to construct those lines. Actually, Tim made this document. Um, and I kind of marked it up. Um, so, for example, you'd pick a conspirator. The manager of that boy band! Then pick from a list that could link another conspirator. Made a deal back in 68 with... Then another conspirator. The dairy industry! And then maybe there's a victim involved, so you link them in. To keep down. And then pick a victim. All of us. And then finish it off with a non sequitur. Did I just think that? Or did someone make me think it? So what I'd like to tell you about today is the dialogue systems we use to create someone like Boyd. And more generally, though, what I hope to do is to give you a pretty good idea of what it takes to get dialogue into a game, uh, what kind of assets and tools you may need to do it, uh, how to approach writing gameplay systems for dialogue. And I'm including under this heading stuff like playing the correct text, sound file, body, uh, face, and lip sync animations, and other game assets associated with the line of dialogue. If you'd like to have dynamic dialogue systems in your game, how to approach doing dynamic responses, uh, conversations, or dialogue trees that take into account and perhaps even modify the game state. And last but not least, what you need to do to support another language, or at least how to keep your options open for translation. Uh, so where do you start with dialogue? Uh, well, in a perfect world, this is how getting recorded dialogue into the game would go. Write dialogue, record dialogue with professional actors, hook the lines up in the game, done, right? No. Unfortunately, this is not the reality. To start with, you might not even have a perfect idea of how you'd like to use the, the dialogue in your game. And maybe you'd like text-only dialogue because you're going to have the user input a bunch of stuff and then use it in sentences. Or maybe your game is fully voiced and you'd like the characters to have, you know, a complex chatter behavior. Or maybe you'd like to have dialogue trees that play elaborate responses and change game data, uh, sorry, change game state as a result of player choice. Getting dialogue into a game is an iterative process, much like it is with a gameplay mechanic. It's not something you can just slap on as an afterthought. It should be symbiotic with the rest of the game. And you're not going to know whether it's truly good until you just implement it and try it. So I'll be giving you a broad overview of what our dialogue implementation process is like at Double Fine, using examples from our Buddha engine that we used, uh, or that we built for Brutal Legend, um, and that we use for all of our 3D rendered games. Um, by the way, if you're wondering where this name comes from, the Buddha engine was named after the San Francisco Chinatown bar. Um, it's a Double Fine tradition to name games after Chinatown bars. Uh, I'll also give examples from the Reds engine, uh, that we use for Broken Age and the recent Amnesia Fortnite project, Dear Leader. Now, before I get to the technical part, I wanted to give you some insights about Tim, uh, Tim's writing. Um, he says that you should try to design your characters well, even the most minor characters, because it will make your story a lot more memorable. And what this really means is creating characters who are specific individuals, not stereotypes. 
because no two characters would approach a problem or react to events in the same way. Now, for almost every character Tim makes, he fills out a character chart, like, like this one, which is not appearing. There we go. OK. And it's just a basic profile of the character, asking questions to establish facts about them and their personality. Um, and the questions are not central to the idea of a character, but for every one you answer, it, it makes him or her kind of more specific and therefore more real and memorable. Um, and um, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to include that PDF of this when I hand in my slides. Um, now I want to tell you a story about Tim designing the camp kids for, uh, in Psychonauts. Uh, before Facebook or even MySpace were a thing, there was a site called Friendster. Do you guys, any of you heard of that? Do you remember? Awesome. So uh, we were all obsessed with Friendster at Double Fine. We were like trying to get the most friends and you know fill out um, our own character sh uh, <laughs> sheets, as it were, and collecting um, friends and writing their like funny testimonials on their profiles and things like that. And Tim realized that Friendster was actually the perfect format for a Camp Kids design document. Um, so he made profiles for all of them on the site. And they, like actually, they all existed until Friendster went down. Um, here's a quote from Tim. He got me thinking about weird questions I had never considered before, like, what is my character's favorite band? And it may never have been revealed during Psychonauts that Chloe Barge was into hardcore rap, but it made me happy to know it. And who knows what effect that made on the dialogue I gave her. So the site sadly doesn't exist anymore, but we've actually recreated it, um, or what it used to be like, and I can give you the URL at the end. So let's say you've done some preliminary character design, and um, whether you've never uh, had dialogue in your game or you're not yet sure how you'd like to have it for a specific project, the best place to start is being able to just represent a line of dialogue in the running game. This could be very simple, like displaying text over a character's head, and what this will let you do is experiment with how you'd like the dialogue in your game to work and whether recorded dialogue is even right for your game. So for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to be referring to dialogue lines. So I'd like to briefly explain what I mean by that. A dialogue line is data about how a single line of dialogue should be played in the game. Um, so here's what a dialogue line looks like in the two engines I mentioned. Uh, the boot engine uses a proprietary scripting language for dialogue data, and RADS uses Lua, but the data looks quite similar. Uh, note the line code there. This code maps to the physical data of a line, like the text associated with it, the sound file, and so on. And we have an offline tool that interfaces with our dialogue database, which contains all the information about each individual line of dialogue. And this database is a master list of every single line in the game in all of the languages into which it's been translated. It's used for generating scripts to give to voice actors when we go to record the lines. Um, it's a tool for our writers, audio designers, localization producers, and implementers. Um, and our database is organized based on game structure. So the example you're seeing here is from Broken Age, and we've set it up by area and then further by scene. Um, and to make life easier for our animators, we break our cutscenes into distinct sections so they can focus on only what happens in a particular scene. So I recommend having a master list of all the dialogue lines in your game, whether you have recorded lines or text only. So why, why would you? Oh, by the way, you don't have to write a tool for this. In the beginning, you can just use Google Spreadsheets. And what you see there is the same data for Boyd's rants as you saw in the previous slide, uh, but in the spreadsheet. And aside from the line text itself, the most important piece of data to have for your line is a unique code. So for Double Fine's games, a line code is constructed from an arbitrary string of four to six characters that we call a scene code, followed by a number, which is just generated at the time the line is entered, followed by the character code. And uh, note that this code is completely arbitrary. The line might get moved around so, so, so that the scene code doesn't match anymore or the number doesn't match, um, that or, or so that they don't strictly correspond to the original setup, and that's OK. The reason to keep the code somewhat human readable is because sometimes it's good for like a last minute sanity check to have some idea of the, of the line's history. Now the benefit of using a unique ID for a line is that the contents, uh, or if the contents ever change, you don't have to track down uh, the line or wh where it's implemented. You can just change it in your database. And this is also invaluable if you have writers who are not super technical. They might have a hard time with the code, but you know something like a spreadsheet is easy to navigate. 
For Broken Age, Tim actually delivered his dialogue in Google Docs uh, to take advantage of the comment feature that it has. And uh, team members could ask questions and make notes right in the doc for everyone to see. And sometimes this resulted in new lines being added or lines changed. Uh, but once the team had a chance to peruse the writing, the lines would be added to our master list. From this master list, a game asset is generated, and that is a descriptor of every line in the game. That is the text, any tags associated with the line, specifications on how to play the audio file, where to find it, and so on. And this is the asset our engine consults to fetch the data associated with the line code. It's also key to how we approach localization at DoubleFine. We hand off a script to the people doing the translations for our, from our database and store the translations as part of the data for each line. Now, since the line code is a unique identifier for a line, we generate a resource file per language and pick the appropriate language file at runtime without having to change any of the dialogue implementation. So a couple of other things I quickly want to mention about localization is that you should make sure the fonts you're using contain all the characters you will need for the languages you need to support. Um, and make sure you pick the right encoding for it. I highly recommend you look up this article by Joel Spolsky for a deeper understanding of character encoding. And I'll have the URL for you on my final slide, so don't worry. Um, some other things you might run into if you are considering localizing into Portuguese. Be careful because Portuguese and Brazilian Portuguese differ substantially. Um, many European Portuguese speakers actually prefer the English version of the game to the Brazilian Portuguese. And as a result, studios unfortunately often end up localizing only into Brazilian Portuguese because not as many people speak English in Brazil as they do in Portugal. Make sure to account for languages with very long words. Uh, the typical culprits are German and Slavic languages, and the bugs are almost always inside menus. Um, I recommend writing a debug feature that uses the longest possible string in any languages uh, you support to find these bugs without having to test each language separately. Um, if a phrase is too long, uh, the fix is usually to just abbreviate words wherever possible and leave enough room for line breaks. So on the subject of line breaks, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Thai often don't use spaces to indicate word breaks. The Thai language actually doesn't even use punctuation. Um, so make sure you consult the rules for how to do line breaks in those languages. For languages that use Chinese characters, you may need to worry about the glyph texture atlas size because it can become absolutely massive. Um, the usual approach is to only include the glyphs used in your game. Um, in other words, don't worry about including every character. Just do some analysis on your text strings. This keeps the atlas at a manageable size. If your game requires you to support user input, you might try to limit the characters to the most commonly used ones and, if possible, rely on other alphabets available in those languages. Uh, very important to remember that if you're taking this approach and your game text changes, you need to also update your glyph texture atlas. So given the representation of a line, how do we play it in the game? So in Double Fine uh, Engines, we first give the character the ability to speak. Um, both Reds and Buddha have a component-based architecture. And of course, what I mean by that is each feature behavior is implemented as a module, and a bunch of these modules are combined to form a single entity or character. It's very similar to how Unity works. Um, what you see there on screen is our in-house level editor for Reds that we call 2HB, which stands for two-headed baby. Um, so let's say we want to have that knife over there speak. So what we do is we just go over, select the knife, and then stick a co-voice component on there. Yep, that's basically it. <laughs> um, anytime we want a particular character to say a line, we call into co-voice and send it a piece of dialogue line data. It looks up the data associated with the line code and takes care of displaying the text portion of the line in the appropriate spot, uh, figures out who the speaker should be and plays any related animations. And if there's a sound associated with it, it sends requests to the sound engine to play it. And by the way, dialogue lines that display like subtitles on the screen are still sent to each individual character's co-voice component, uh, which then uses a shared space at the bottom of the screen to display. In Broken Age, each character's subtitle has a different color, um, and it's a property you can set in the co-voice component. So let's say you're able to display text lines over a character's head. Well, now what? Well, presumably, you'd need the ability to play more than just one line, so that when a line ends, a new one can begin. And uh, furthermore, you may need to know when an entire sequence of these lines completes so you can trigger a gameplay event or even another sequence of these lines. Um, 
There are many ways to tackle the design of such a sequencer, and you need to consider who will be implementing the dialogue in your game and how dynamic the dialogue in your game will be. So for instance, you can think of a sequence of these lines as a linear cutscene, right, in which characters animate, visual effects and sounds fire, and so on, based on a timeline of events. Um, this linear paradigm is easy to represent as a graphical tool that even someone who is not very technical will have little trouble getting used to because the idea of a timeline is a familiar concept to anyone who's done any sound or video editing or animation, right? So this is the in-house uh, tool that we, we call the cutscene editor that we use to create cutscenes at Double Fine. So we take game assets and stitch them together in here, and this part is usually initially automated. Uh, but then our animators, visual effects artists, audio designers, programmers, they can open a cutscene in this tool and add various additional uh, timeline-based commands. So for the dialog line, the data gets converted to the data structure CoVoice uh, expects and is sent off. By the way, this is how the cutscene you just saw in the cutscene editor plays in the game. This data cannot get any worse. Oh! What? What the? Um, things get trickier if you want your dialogue to be dynamic, logic-driven, based on context or game state. It may be possible to represent this with a graphic tool, but I don't recommend that you start there. Um, instead, start with the data that defines the dialogue sequence and the ability to play it in your game. There are a number of great approaches to dynamic dialogue, and I really urge you to check out these fantastic talks if you have GDC Vault access. Maybe some of you have it. Um, this one by Elon Ruskin of uh, Valve Corporation at GDC 2012 called Rule Database for Contextual Dialogue and Game Logic, or How to Make Writers Even More Awesome. And this one by Jason Gregory of Naughty Dog from last year about the dynamic dialogue in The Last of Us. The approach to dynamic dialogue at, at Double Fine uh, is similar, and it kind of emerged from the particular collaboration that we have with you know, our writers, gameplay programmers, and our audio team over the years. So where do we use dynamic dialogue in Double Fine games? So one simple example is just storytelling outside of cutscenes. So in this video I'm about to show you from Brutal Legend, Ophelia and Eddie meet for the first time. They have their initial exchange in the cutscene, but we didn't really want to pause the action for too long. So we continued their story exposition as they were fighting, making sure that less important lines didn't interrupt the dialogue. Who are you? Uh, right shoulder. <laughs> We've got to get out of here before he arrives. Yeah. Wait, before who arrives? Emperor Diviculus. Who? Emperor Diviculus, where are you from? It's kind of hard to say. Um, I kind of live on the road. Be assured, you don't want to be here when he arrives. What's the big deal? You're slaughtering his personal guard for one thing. Oh, aha. We also use dynamic dialogue for reactions to player actions. So in this video, Raz is going to try out his psychic powers on Boyd, um, namely telekinesis and pyrokinesis, and I think also punching. Ah, I'm telling you, I don't know where the milkman is. Where are those stupid crows? Ah, they've come for me. They're taking me away. The squirrels, please, maybe. Oh no, it's happening again. Spontaneous combustion from the government LSD tests. Uh, we use dynamic dialogue as a reaction to player choice. So in this video from Broken Age, Vela is asked to explain what actually happened at the Maiden's Feast. Well, the real answer is that she escaped, which will be the first, uh, the, the topmost choice, as you'll see. But the player is able to give a different account of events. Can you guys help me? I need to get back to sugar bunting right away. You're from sugar bunting? So that's why you smell like frosting. What's the big rush? Stay here and float a while. So that's the real one. This, uh, friend of mine escaped the Maiden's Feast, really messed things up. She what? What kind of selfish monster would run away from such an honor? Such a joyous occasion. Um, it can also be used for player expression. Uh, in Dear Leader, we let the player provide their official title and stamp and then use it throughout the game. Um, 
Another important use of the dynamic dialogue is for telegraphing gameplay information. So for instance, when you're about to get attacked. Um, in this clip from Psychonauts, Coach Hammer is broadcasting what kind of attack he's about to launch in that like typical superhero fashion. Um, and it helps the player counter the attack appropriately, either by getting out of the way or, in this case, using the shield power. So here's another one for Brutal Legend, where a huge monster is attacking Eddie in his car, and right before the attack, uh, Eddie will make a comment about it so that the player knows to slam on the gas. Oh, here she goes again! Uh, later on, Eddie and Ophelia are driving over a bridge that's in the process of collapsing, um, and they shout out things that kind of help the player navigate out of the wreckage. Uh -oh. Besides! Besides! Um, we also use dynamic dialogue to breathe life into characters, as you saw with Boyd earlier. Um, so the way we approach dynamic dialogue is by first organizing it logically based on how it will be used. So I mentioned dialogue lines before. Uh, we use dialogue sets to organize dialogue lines into a logical collection. The set contains instructions about how the entire set of lines should be played. And what this does is provide us with more options for organizing dialogue and let us use dialogue in more creative ways. So a dialogue set can represent a linear sequence of lines from one character. Note the little pauses before each line, which allow us to fine tune the timing of the lines. And here's how this dialogue set plays in the game. Um, it's it's uh, to set this up. This is the spoon getting anxious that the player is not picking him up. Good morning, Commander Shay. It is my honor to be your training spoon today. Can't wait to start mission nutrition. So just pick me up and we'll start filling you up with space fuel. Nope. Is something wrong, Commander Chef? Please say something, Commander. Are you waiting for another spoon? We could send in a replacement, but I have to let you know I requested this mission specifically. I was on a waiting list for months. Uh, even though you've been very hard on us spoons in the past, even cruel, I... I just wanted you to know that working with you has been my lifelong dream. Oh god, I'm so embarrassed. I'll just shut up now. But seriously, <laughs> you should eat. Many important missions today. Okay. Shutting up. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Okay. Um, it's also <laughs> easy to represent conversations in this way simply by specifying the speaker. Um, this is how we represented the Ophelia and Eddie talking while fighting clip you saw earlier. Uh, the set could also be a collection of dialogue lines from which the game will choose randomly. So for instance, when this set is played in the game, the sequencer will pick just one line from these and then stop. A uh, feature I, I particularly like is being able to pick lines from two different sets. So what you, you see there um, is uh, it picks a line from a dialogue set where she is excited to break free into space, and then from another dialogue set where he's disappointed because he's still attached by the hose. So here it is in the game. Space! Why is my air hose so short? Woo! Man! Can't catch me this time. Come on. In, uh, in short, there are some features for dialog systems that have proven extremely useful over the years in Double Fine games, and I've divided them up into basic and advanced features. So for the baseline features, uh, in-engine representation of the line. That is the ability to play audio, uh, display text, content, or both, and to have data on the line's duration. In-engine indication of which entity should say the line. Um, and as I showed earlier, you can use the setting to implement conversations in a single dialogue set so that every other line has a different speaker, if that's what you want. 
um, how long to pause before the line is played, both per line and per set. Sometimes you don't want a line to start immediately or might want some additional control over the timing like how we saw in the spoon uh, dialog set. And it's much better to do that in a dynamic way rather than edit the sound file by hand, right? Because you can tweak it much faster. Um, now, uh, another one is whether to pick one line to play from the dialog set or to play them all. Um, this makes dialog sets useful for representing a single line reaction or some, uh, to something um, as well as for conversations. Uh, ability to play lines sequentially or randomly. And uh, these features are used to make dialect sets more versatile, as I showed before. Uh, last but not least, the ability to play animations that go with that line. If you have lines that play outside of cutscenes, you'll probably want to talk animation on the body, like a generic one or maybe a custom one based on the data associated with the line. And the ability to play mouth flap or lip sync animations. So for some more advanced features, uh, weighted random selection of lines. This is useful for reactions to common game events that fire often, like getting hit. So you might have a higher probability on the normal uh! sound, or uh, more, more so than a line like this. You better hope you didn't just give me an infection. And actually, both of these were used as hit reactions in Brutal Legend. Um, you, you also probably want the ability to specify how long to wait after a particular dialogue set has played before it plays again. Um, ability to sequence a set of other dialog sets in addition to dialog lines. Uh, choosing which dialog sets to play based on priority. So for instance, if you're in the middle of an important dramatic exchange with a character, you probably don't want to hear them commenting on you know, a cool collectible nearby. Um, so you would label the collectible reaction as lower priority than the critical dialog. Another really great feature to have is the ability to specify whether a line can be interrupted. Um, this feature really saved our butt on uh, Brutal Legend. Uh, early on in the game, Eddie got to ride this crazy altar walker. And Tim wrote lines of dialogue that Eddie would say when the walker was stopped, so praying to the metal gar guards to, uh, God, sorry, to start it moving again. Oh man, gotta get this thing moving. Let's see here. Um, evil, uh... So kind of hesitant, Eddie is like a little unsure of himself maybe. Um, and there are lines that Eddie would chant when the walker moved to encourage the thing to keep moving. Dear evil, messed up demon powers of darkness, uh, and unimaginable evil. So a much more confident sounding than the stop dialogue. The problem is that to move the walker, the player just had to hold down uh, the stick in a direction. And to stop, the player could simply let go of the stick, right? So as you can imagine, this is very easy to do on a controller. And so you could very quickly toggle the walker between the two dialogue states, or the, you know, the stopped and moving state. And this would prompt Eddie to interrupt himself over and over and over. And the result was totally chaotic, kind of like this. Oh, man. Dear evil, man, gotta get this of darkness. Let's e um, e uh, and unimaginable. So it's impossible to tell what Eddie's even saying there, right? So instead, we set these dialogue sets to finish playing as their interrupt behavior. So if a line was already playing, it was allowed to finish before a uh, line from the new state played, right? So here's how it sounded in the final game. And you can see that sometimes the line doesn't perfectly align with the state the walker is in, but it's a much better experience for the player and it still kind of conveys the spirit of the dialogue. Oh man, gotta get this thing moving. Let's see here. Um, evil, uh, oh powerful, majestic, slithering? Dear evil, messed up demon powers of darkness, uh, and unimaginable uh hev no not heavenly sulfur smelling dear wait should i say dear oh hellish beings of evil please transport me off this awesome corpse pile i am but a visitor in your strange world which some would call hellish but i have to admit it's kind of bad demons of the underworld demonic authorities to whom it may oh god i mean oh evil god man this is tough Oh, lords of gross leather things and S&M type wear. You know you guys really have style. That battle nun, <laughs> she was hot. Uh, sorry about killing her, uh, but you're evil though, right? So we're cool. I didn't even know I could do that with an ax. By your good graces, uh-oh. Uh, I meant evil! Evil grace! So back to our feature list, uh, to one of my favorites, the ability to set up logic for which lines or sets to select for play based on game state. 
Uh, and that brings us to dynamic dialogue systems. So once there is a way to represent the sequence di uh, uh, to represent and sequence dialogue lines in the game, you can build on that dialogue set data structure to give characters a lot of depth, to let them react to the things happening around them or to them in a much more dynamic way. So I will present a couple of examples. So in Brew Legend, we had stage battles where a lot of characters were, you know, fighting side by side, getting hit, firing off like clever one-liners, and generally reacting to the things going on, all of which had to be vocalized and to sound good. And as I mentioned before, the Buddha engine has a component-based architecture, so the events to which all of these characters were responding were just coming from all over the code base. And it would have been an authoring nightmare to have dialogue li lines hooked up in every single component, right? So. Uh, what we did instead was to fire off an event that something has happened in the character's component. And if the Covoy's component had a reaction to it, it would fire off. So if it didn't have a reaction or if something more important was being said at the time, nothing would be spoken by the character. The data Covoy's checked looked like this. On the left side is the dialogue type, and on the right side, the dialogue set reaction we want to play. And it's just a normal dialogue set. Uh, these are all optional, by the way. If you don't want a character to have a reaction to something, you simply leave the mapping out. Uh, the rules that determined which of these dialogue events would fire were in the components themselves. It allowed us to create hooks for these reactions very quickly um, as gameplay programmers. So if you have writers who don't mind a bit of scripting and debugging, I recommend you check out the Elon Ruskin, Ruskin and Jason Gregory talks I mentioned. Uh, about using fact dictionaries to, con to construct like a simple scripting language and then it can define rules um, in the dialogue data itself. I'd like to give you some examples of a dialogue system where we did use rule evaluation in the data um, and that system is the dialogue trees in Broken Age. Um, so think of each dialogue choice you see there as a node and each level of depth that is like kind of a list of those things um, as a collection of nodes. Here's what a single node uh, in a dialogue tree looks like under the hood. Each dialogue choice has a display line code associated with it, a reaction to play when it gets chosen, so usually a bunch of dialogue, and a bunch of logic that defi defines whether it appears or not. In Broken Age, our game state is a collection of various facts about the game, that is numbers, strings, and booleans that are keyed by a symbolic string. And this enables us to have a simple way to represent logic in, in dialogue tree data as a sort of scripting shorthand. So whether a dialogue choice appears or not is determined from the following checks. Appears when, this is an and check, and everything on this list has to check out before the node will be shown. Appears when any, this is an or check, so at least one of the things on the list has to be sh uh, true for, this, for us to show the node. Um, and similarly, the, the disappears check, disappears when, it's an and check, everything has to be true to, to hide the node. And disappears when any, um, just one thing has to be true and then the node will be hidden. When picking a node, it can additionally set some logic, which can be used to turn it off or you know, set other game state. Um, we found this to be expressive and flexible on dialogue trees in Broken Age, so, and I have applied it to uh, dialogue lines to make it much easier to author very custom reactions for our characters. So let me walk you through an example of dynamically choosing dialogue lines based on state in Broken Age. So let's say that we want Vela to say a line as she exits one scene, um, and a second follow-up line when she enters another. So here are the two dialogue sets. Um, they're sticky enough already, get it sticky. Now this doesn't actually exist in the game, I just made this up for the presentation. Um, they've been set up to fire in script, and if we travel between these two scenes, it works as expected. They're sticky enough already. Get it? Stick E. Very dumb, sorry guys. Um, so, but we qu quickly see a problem. You can fast travel to another scene in Broken Age, so it's possible that Vela will never say that first line. And the second line doesn't really make sense without the first. Get it? Stick E. Right. Um, to fix this, we include both the first and the second line in the second dialogue set. Um, and we add some logic to the first dialogue set um, to mark that the dialogue line is finished playing. It's just an arbitrary flag that I'm making up right there. And in the second dialogue set, we only play the first line if it has not yet played. And then just reset this logic. There we go. So here it is, problem solved. 
first. They're uh, sticky enough already. The way that we did it initially. Get it? Stick E. And now with fast travel. They're sticky enough already. Get it? Stick E. So let's say you try out the text-only approach for the dialogue in your game and decide that it's just not as good as fully voiced. My advice to you, get audio middleware. So what a good audio middleware does is give your audio designer, even if that's also you, uh, much more control over the creation and implementation of sound in your game. So more specifically, you'll get a sophisticated GUI tool to create, adjust, mix, organize, all the sound in the game without any intervention from a programmer. And it's really worth stressing the importance of this. What I mean by mixing is the process of adjusting the relative volume of everything in the game so that it just sounds right. And I'll have more on this a little later. Um, there are also a lot of cool features you get out of the box that you can use for voice, like 3D positional sound, digital signal processing filters, occlusion, reverb, and so on, that help give color to the voice. It will help you with things like all your sound fitting within download and memory budgets, making sure the compression introduces no noticeable artifacts, low latency for playing high demand sounds, and so on. You'll be able to ship on many different platforms without much work on your part. Uh, and you'll also be able to use the same sound assets on high-end PCs as, uh, and low-end phones, because the middleware will just do its best to play the sound on however many sound channels the device offers. And more than anything, it just really empowers your audio designers creatively to have good tools. You'll get a much better sounding game, and you barely have to do a thing as a programmer. Um, when do you not need audio middleware? Well, if your game doesn't have any sound, I guess, or if it's just not central to the game's experience. So I will say that many people tend to underestimate the importance of sound in their game. And maybe you're interested in writing your own audio engine. And in that case, I recommend uh, you still take a look at the feature sets or of existing middleware engines just so you know what features you may end up needing. Or maybe you have no money. Well, that used to be an issue, but now FMOD Studio is completely free for games with small budgets. And I think engines like Unity have FMOD integration already. So basically, it's just worth getting because it will save you a lot of trouble. So let's get into some more specifics about the audio pipeline because it actually affects a number of disciplines aside from just our audio team. So once we are ready to professionally record our lines, we use um, our dialogue tool to generate scripts for our studio actors that contain all the information about the lines, including any stage directions, line directions, and so on. Um, actors actually really like to know the context for what they're reading. So as much information about the scene as possible, even if you think it's not going to be useful. Um, during the recording process, sometimes new lines are created that come from actor improvisation or alternative readings. And sometimes it's just a subtitle, or so, sorry, sometimes it's just a subtle change in wording, but we go back to our master list and update the text of the line to match the audio. So if the line is completely new and Tim would like to keep something as an alternative reading, these lines are added as brand new line codes into the master list and will eventually need to be integrated into the game, either by an animator if it's a cutscene or a programmer if it's dynamic dialogue. Uh, once the lines are recorded, they're ready to be cut. So this is a screenshot from an actual edit showing some of our workflow. As you can see, the original recording is intact as, as, the audio, uh, as our audio team edits, uh, with the selected cuts happening in the bottom track there. Um, the original is also backed up in as many drives as possible because hardware failures are so common and we've lost a lot of audio before. Uh, each line is edited pretty tightly and consistently across all lines. They will usually fade up in the beginning of the line and fade down at the end to account for any background noise or awkward breaths. And once the edits are complete, the lines are batch processed for volume normalization. Camden Stoddard, our senior sound supervisor, shared with me the magical number they use to normalize dialogue lines. It's minus four decibels. And by the way, no matter what number is used, some lines will have to be adjusted by hand. Um, some just won't sound right. Uh, for instance, any lines that have whispering, you actually want those to sound quieter, and your brain will expect it. Um, Camden had this caveat on the subject. Uh, audio engineers are extremely cautious about normalization because there's nothing standard about the dynamics of sound. Um, the thing is that dynamics and emotions um, it gets removed during normalization. Your brain actually really likes waveforms that have like you know troughs and crests and nuance to them. If you're interested in this topic, um, do a search on the loudness wars when you get a chance. Um, the slide shows ZZ Top's Sharp Dressed Man um, and how it got remastered from its original 1983 release in recent years. 
So as you see, like it starts out, there's like, you know, some dynamics and then it becomes kind of like a chocolate bar at the end there. Um, when it comes to mixing the game, that is figuring out the relative volume and focus of the sound in your game, you need to think about what is important or what is most important for you to convey. If your game is about storytelling, then dialogue trumps all. So whenever someone speaks, that line must be heard and it has to sound good. So this means that you may end up spending much less time on sound effect design because the player is simply not going to hear sound effects very clearly. Um, and since we get the extremely talented Peter McConnell to compose music for us in a lot of our projects at Double Fine. Um, and because music has the capacity to convey so much emotion, music is the next most important thing, typically, when our audio designers mix the game. Then usually, you know, sound effects will trump ambience. It really depends. Uh, this could all totally be different for your game, so it's, but it's definitely something worth uh, thinking about, even for programmers, because it informs what tools and systems you'll need to make available to your audio team for mixing and ducking sound. So on Broken Age, for example, we duck our music slightly and our sound effects significantly when a line starts playing. As you can see. So once you have recorded dialogue and animated characters on screen who speak it, it's important to consider how this will impact animation. We actually only do temporary layouts for fully animated cutscenes in our games until the final pro voice comes, uh, comes in. Um, here's what a layout cutscene would look like with our scratch dialogue, like scratch recorded by the team. Surprise! Whoa. Yay! There is my Valuria. Oh, look at my pretty girl. I can't believe. Oh, I just can't believe. We're very proud of you. I think that's what your mother's trying to say. She's not even dressed yet. We can do that after cake. Cake first. All right, but come on. Let's get this good time over with. Oh, yes, cake. Now, where did I put that knife? Nobody touches that cake until I find the ceremonial knife. <sighs> and here's what it looked like in the final game. Surprise! My Valoria. Oh, look at my pretty girl. I can't believe. I just can't believe. We're very proud of you. I think that's what your mother is trying to say. Oh, she's not even dressed yet? Can we do that after cake? Come on, cake first! All right, but come on. Let's get this good time over with. So the reason you can't properly do fully animated cutscenes until you have the final voice is that our animators use the actor performance to guide them. This is a quote from our lead animator in Broken Age, Raymond Crook, about just how much voice acting informs the animation. You need to internalize the performance and translate it into something physical your characters would do as they say those lines. So if not every line in your game is, a fully, or is in a fully animated cutscene, um, but you don't want the fidelity of your game to suffer, you'll need some additional systems for supporting voice lines. I mentioned before that co the co-voice component can play animations associated with the lines of dialogue. Well, in Broken Age, we have many lines that are spoken outside of cutscenes. And so what we do is request three talk animations from our animators. We use a short talk animation for lines that are less than one second long medium length talk animation for lines longer than one but less than two seconds long, and a long talk animation for anything longer than that. Additionally, it's possible to specify a gesture for a particular line in our master list. So for instance, here we're going to add a gesture for Curtis to point to himself. And when the engine goes to play the line, that gesture maps to the appropriate animation for a character. We also do lip sync for our characters. So in hand animated cutscenes, typically our animators create the mouth and lip, uh, mouth and facial an uh, expressions, um, hand animated. But for lines that play procedurally, we play an additive animation for the face for each particular line. It would require quite a bit of work to hand animate every single line of dialogue in the game, as you can imagine. So what we do instead is run an automated process to help us generate the initial animation that our animators can then go in and clean up if necessary. The way this is done is first, our animators set up poses on uh, each speaking character for the mouth, representing the shapes the mouth would make when generating a particular sound. 
and then map them to all the sounds in a particular language. The tool we, we use then analyzes the text for the line and the waveform for all the lines um, for, the, for that character and generates an animation using the provided poses. So sometimes the animator would have to go in and clean them up, but actually in Broken Age it worked almost like perfectly each time. Uh, once you commit to doing audio in your game, thinking of dialogue as a gameplay mechanic becomes even more important. So just like when you're doing combat mechanics, you would start with stubbed animations and poses. Rather than polished animation, you should start your dialogue implementation with scratch recordings of the lines. And what I mean is as soon as all your dialogue systems are set up, do a recording of yourself or someone else in your team just saying the lines and use that recording in the game, not just a text line. So Scratch Dialogue brings your game a step closer to finished. Um, you're implementing stand-ins for what will eventually become like the final asset, uh, game assets, right? So you'll have a game you can demo much easier, and um, you will get information like knowing exactly how large your voice banks uh, will be. And it will help you detect and fix a number of problems that you would not have been able to solve with text-only display. You'll be able to immediately hear if a line sounds unnatural or off. Uh, certain things will become immediately obvious, like you know, if everyone's talking all over each other. Uh, maybe there are long, noticeable silences between sequences of conversation, and you'll need to write more lines you know, to make it sound right. Maybe a scene with dialogue drags on too long, and it usually does if you have too much exposition. Uh, maybe a line repeats too often. So this one's actually a real problem, and here's some advice for this. For whatever reason, the brain is very good at being able to tell that there is a lack of variety in sound, especially from a human voice. So for any emotes, record as many takes as possible. And for commonly heard reactions, write at least five variations and use shorter lines. And of course, weigh the shorter lines so that they play more frequently. Uh, try not to repeat jokes. They're usually only funny once. Um, record lots of hmm and ha huh type emotes, right? Because they can be used in a lot of places. So for instance, like, to fix some of the more repetitive sequences or you know, at the 11th hour when you realize you don't have a reaction for something. And by the way, in that Boyd muttering sequence, um, I inserted lots of these um, uh, to help stitch the lines together better. Um. <laughs> so another trick is to ask the voice actor to help you out with their performance. So on Broken Age, we had this problematic line that had to fire off every time you finished talking to Gus and it just felt very repetitive. Uh, but because we had that scratch recording well before we re went to record with like the professional actor, we knew that we were going to need help from them. Uh, so when we got Pendleton Ward in the recording studio, you guys might know him, he's the creator of Adventure Time, right? Uh, Tim asked him to do a few takes of it, and by the end we had a whole lot of variations. Now just get over here, grab my underwear, and unhook it from this branch! Do you want me to make up things? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Sure, if you want to. My underwear! It's on the branch. Can you unhook it, please? Unhook my underwear. <laughs> get, get over here and unhook me from the branch. My underwear is on the branch. <laughs> Who wrote these lines? Can you just come down just writing them all right now. Me? Oh yeah, cut my underwear. Cut it. <laughs> oh, yeah, cut it. Cut my underwear. Keep cutting it. This is how it worked in the game. Well, you hang in there, kid. My underwear is on this branch. Get over here and unhook it. Sorry, I'm not going anywhere near your underwear. Come here and help me. Well, you hang in there, kid. Get, get over here and unhook me from the branch. My underwear is on the branch. Well, you hang in there, kid. My underwear is on this branch. Get over here and unhook it. All right, one more. <laughs> well, you hang in there, kid. Get, get over here and unhook me from the branch. My underwear is on the branch. So, by the way, there's a danger to using scratch recording that I want to warn you about, and that is you get attached. So I don't know if it's because you know and love the people on the recording or because, um, you know, first impressions really last. Uh, but there are many times that we really missed the scratch recordings, even though we knew the professional actor was better. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, Eric Wolpa, who co-wrote Psychonauts with Tim Schafer and then went on to write Portal and Portal 2 at Valve, was in charge of scratch recording on Psychonauts. 
And here he is, his lungfish revolutionary from the lungfishopolis level, just so you get a sense of what his normal voice sounds like. Great plan, Kogalor. I'll act the fence. You keep that Caesar off my back. Freedom! And here's our senior animator, Ray Crook, playing Raz, Tim Schaefer playing the coach, and Eric playing Elton in falsetto in the intro to Basic Braining. So this is it. The mental world. It looks like a dentist's office. A mental dentist office. It's a recruiting office, kids. And I'm here to recruit you for the greatest job in the world. Being a psychonaut, it's not about science or feelings, no matter what those other camp counselors say. It's about fighting a war for mental freedom. Are you ready to face torture, insanity, death? Because this is your last chance to chicken out. Ooh, me, sir. I'd like to chicken out, please. Too late, soldier. Um, and it's disarming for me to hear those recordings because I know and love those guys, but I know the game is better for having the pro actors in there, and you got to keep that in mind in your game, too. And here's what it sounded like with professional actors. And you actually notice there's a trim. The, one of the lines got trimmed as a result of the scratch. So, this is it. The mental world. It looks like a dentist office. A mental dentist office. It's a recruiting office, kids. And I'm here to recruit you for the greatest job in the world. Being a psychonaut. It's about fighting a war for mental freedom. Are you ready to face torture, insanity, and death? Because this is your last chance to chicken out. Oh, me, sir. I'd like to chicken out, please. Too late, soldier. So to conclude, I want to bring back uh, this flow diagram from earlier and kind of fix it so it represents the reality of working with dialogue a little better. Um, so I'll leave the beginning the same, but I'll say that starting with writing is just a thing for some games, but for others, maybe the best thing is to sit down with the game and see where the writing would really add to the experience. The next thing would, should definitely be to hook the lines up in the game somehow. Um, but um, this is the more descriptive in terms of what you should be thinking at this point. So getting lines in the game as early as possible is, is very important, so you should start with something simple and build from there. And it's entirely possible that this might happen, that hooking lines up will make you reconsider how you're writing the game, so maybe it'll even spur you on to write more. And pretty quickly, you'll need to add tracking lines as part of your process. You should create a master list of all the dialogue, and I recommend using a unique ID for each line um, and using the, the code, uh, that code when implementing it. And at this stage, you should be able to decide what dialogue systems your game will need. Maybe you'll need your characters to animate when the line is kicked off. Or maybe you'll need a fancy way to display the line that requires player input. Uh, or maybe it's a dynamic dialogue system. So building those systems, whatever your game needs to do dialogue well, also becomes an important part of the process. It helps you author dialogue more quickly and to represent it in the game in ever more sophisticated ways. Uh, if you should decide to do voice dialogue, you will need to beef up your entire pipeline to account for the editing, tracking, and implementing the voice lines. You should get audio middleware to make it easier to do sound in your game and make, it, make time in the schedule for your audio team to edit the lines. Uh, do scratch recording as early as possible to work out the kinks in the audio and writing. Um, and if you have cutscenes in your game, keep in mind that it means your animators won't be able to finalize everything until the voice is in. And the most important thing, think of dialogue as something that is integral to the core experience, like a game mechanic. If you plan to include dialogue, you should start thinking about how it will work in your game as early as possible so that the narrative comes together holistically with all the other game mechanics that you have. So I hope you found this useful. Thanks so much. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'd just like to say that I'm a huge uh, Double Fine fangirl. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> so I'm starstruck. Um, but uh, as a synthesized voice gets better and better, uh, and well, maybe in the future it'll, it will, it'll be something common in games, uh, how different will be with the process of both the tools that you need to use and writing the dialogue around that change. 
You know what's funny is that we actually I didn't mention this during the talk, but we have synthesized voices partly like before Scratch can be recorded. We we run like this automated process to get like text to speech, vo like waveforms uh, into the game. And the reason I don't mention it is because Tim hates it. He hates it so much he thinks it's the worst. He would rather have like really badly Scratch recorded dialogue than hear the text only lines. Um, so for him, it actually hinders the writing to hear a synthesized version of it. Um, it's, it could be, it could very well be different for other writers. What I, I will say, the reason, the main reason we do the, you know, that text-to-speech thing anyway, is because for for gameplay programmers, it's like you know, you have the necessary pause um, and something is said. So like, just the experience of play testing something is much much closer to the final product. And also, the weird thing is the animators tell me that when they animate to the text, the, the text to speech line, it's a lot closer to how the pro actors say it. Like the timing is closer to theirs than it is to the scratch recording. So that's something too. Thank you. No worries. Hi. Hi. Uh, great talk. Um, it was very nice to see, um, like, um, to see that dialogue actually matters, like, in very many different ways. Um, I was thinking, like, how um, do you, uh, like, scope dialogue, like, as game design and stuff? Like, um, when to use it, was there something you wanted to add but couldn't in some games that you missed or something? Yeah, so that's that's an awesome question. So basically, the way that it scopes is like we try to implement it as early as possible because you never want to be surprised by dialogue not working, and like which happens all the time. Like we we change dialogue all the time. Um, the thing that usually kind of prevents us from um, you know growing the scope of dialogue is that you only have a, a set number of sessions with your professional actors. And so you have to like you know get all the kinks out of the dialogue before you ever record with them, B and like you know once you record and it's very it can be very expensive and once you record like you might not have either the budget or really the time like maybe the actor just can't record with you ever again right so like you really have to figure everything out before you do that at the end, um, but generally we try to like you know because dialogue is like such a central part of double fine games like we have dialogue very early. We try to like really iterate on the writing and things like that, like as we develop the game along with everything else. Like what you saw there, like with like the little red bots and like the text lines over the face, like that's literally the first thing I worked on on Broken Age. So pretty early on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hello. Thanks for a great talk. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm a big fan of yeah. Uh, every, I'm wondering if uh, uh, when you're designing this system for dialogue and other things, mm -hmm. do you take into consideration what other projects you might do in the future and treat uh, dialogue systems as company assets uh, and such things? And in that case, how would that change your scope of the systems that you make? Yeah, so um, so like I can answer this in two parts. So first of all, in Psychonauts, when we were first writing the dialogue systems, uh, that because we we Tim was at first the only writer, and then Eric Walpa, when he joined, he was actually a programmer as well as a writer, which is crazy. But it also allowed him like he kind of knew the system in depth, so he knew he when he would like getting a script for him was kind of from him rather was kind of a pleasure because he knew the system. He would never do anything the system couldn't do. Tim, like on the other hand, so we would think like, okay, this is it. This is, we wrote the most foolproof thing. Like, no, no way that Tim is gonna like outsmart us this time. And then the very next thing he delivers, like, we totally had to rewrite it. And so our focus from the get-go, because we were so strapped for time on programming side, we had to like be as flexible as possible. Like, it had to be like a very simple system, but it had to account for all the things that Tim might want to do with the dialogue, right? And so what that did in the end is that we, by the time we finished Psychonauts, like we kind of learned our lessons and we knew how to like, it turns out that writing a system like that it was flexible enough for pretty much any dialogue that you would want in a game, right? And then I guess 
I guess generally there were times when uh, the writer of a game, like for instance for Costume Quest, we had uh, Gabe Miller who was actually a very technical guy. And so he would write and then he kind of like for, for ease of implementation, you know how I mentioned in the talk like that if you have a technical writer, you probably w should come up with like a little scripting language for them because they'll be able to handle it and it's much faster just for, for everyone in the process. Um, so he, I wrote like some features for him so that he could actually script up dialogue really quickly, like right in the data. And so he would write dialogue and like, you know, add logic to it and he would hear it in the game immediately. So um, I think it really depends, like you, pr you want a system that's as flexible as possible, but then you also might have to write some additional stuff uh, based on who's implementing and writing your game, right? I did another project with, this is not Double Fine related, but um, someone's, uh, someone's father was writing everything in Excel. And so what I had to write for the dialogue there is um, like a way to export from Google Spreadsheets into like, you know, a format that the game could understand and then like process all of that. So like it really, yeah, it depends on who your uh, developers are on the team. Okay, thank you. Hey. Hey. Great talk. Thanks. Um, so I was wondering about, uh, especially with the, the games like um, Brutal Legend that had much more complicated requirements in, in some cases for dynamic dialogue, mm -hmm. um, what kind of debug tools uh, you found very useful? Because I imagine that, uh, especially if you're having um, certain uh, dialogues only be triggered in certain events, but other ones, um, other events uh, overriding those, like mm -hmm. what kind of um, debug tools did you find to be very useful for that kind of system? Yeah, um, so basically um, we lucked out on Brew Legend in that we had programmers implementing the lines. And so we had, a, for, for one thing, we had de uh, debuggers, right? Um, the other thing is I actually had a couple of like, I would print things out just in the console and it would explain, it would give a brief explanation for why it picked this line versus another. So it was just kind of like a verbose output mm -hmm. of what was happening. Um, but if you really wanted to debug like what was going wrong, um, you know, because we were all programmers, we could actually put breakpoints and, you know, do that stuff. But I, you know, of course, if you have less technical people implementing some of like the scripting logic, then you would have to kind of lean more on systems that, were very explicit of like you know what the decisions were that the uh, you know the dialogue engine was making. Mm -hmm. um, and one other question: mm -hmm. uh, It seems you give a very good overview of sort of all of the different moving parts that combine to create these systems. And um, I'm wondering: It seems like there are a lot of potential bottlenecks. Uh, mm -hmm. Like if you don't get the dialogue, the script in, or if you don't um, get the voice acting on time, or whatever. Um, what kind of things do you do at Double Fine to kind of mitigate that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And one for like some of that I don't have an answer for. For instance, if Tim doesn't hand in a script, the, there's nothing we can do. We just have to <laughs> wait, right? But um, what often helps writers is like to know what the str like. It's really easy to get writer's block if you don't have any constraints at all for like what you have. So. Um, and uh, there, there are a couple of writers that I've worked with who didn't really, uh, who hadn't written for games before and so they weren't sure exactly, you know, so for some of these things like lines often repeating, they might not have been aware that you need to have like a lot of them, right? A lot of, mm -hmm. and so what I did was I would write a template for them. Sometimes I would actually implement the template directly in the game with like very temp dialogue. And uh, what's funny is like some of my temp dialogue actually shipped, <laughs> which is great, which is very, very flattering really, but um, like you often want to make that temp dialogue really stupid so that the person would be tempted to change the line, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so you'd have like, you know, at least something, some setup like mission structure or like, you know, like let's say you come up to a character, they'll, uh, they'll explain to you what their story is and like what they need from you and then you, that's kind of what Costume Quest was like, right? Um, and there, like, there was a very um, kind of standard structure for that in that game. So when I was working on Once Upon a Monster, I was working with a kind of a, a green writer. And what I did was I set up a, a huge template for, for, for her from, for all the lines that I knew we were going to need. And I told her how many we would need to write for that. And so that's what she kind of had to work with. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hello. Uh, so... Uh, dialogue in, in games are very different from like theater and movies. 
uh, in that it's, it's uh, really non-linear in comparison, uh, especially when story becomes part of, of gameplay. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach the script generation for, for uh, like to, to make, to generate a script that is intuitive to voice actors? I imagine they are quite used to this, but do you have any like tricks or something that you? Yeah, I mean, the, the best trick, first of all, like what we found with voice actors is that people who play games, like for instance, Jack Black and Elijah Wood who play a lot of games, are or like, you know, you have a lot of voice actors that Tim uses on games specifically, so they know the medium. They actually have a really good um, sense for how those lines are going to be used. And they're going to, when they record the voice, they're going to keep that in mind. If you, have, if you end up hiring an actor who's never done game voice, you're going to have to direct them a little bit more. And so I guess my answer here is that you want to provide as much context as possible for the actors when they're like recording. So for instance, let's say uh, you have like all these dynamic lines or like, you know, branching story and stuff. You have to really make it clear to the actor that these can be set in any order or that, you know, whatever it is that's the, that you need for the logic of your game to work. They have to be made aware of like what the context will be where, you know, their recording will be used. And um, I mean, the other th the other thing is okay. So, so major major thing is if you are respond, if you're the writer in the game, I recommend that you are there for the recording sessions because sometimes actors like sometimes a joke doesn't come across or like you know someone puts the emphasis on the wrong word or something in a sentence, um, and you can be there to like fix that and to prevent you know that like those kinds of small disasters or whatever. Um, the other thing is like try to you know if you can use actors who have worked with games before because that it just makes it easier mm. uh, and I have another question as well uh, about the like sound analysis tool that uh, detects uh, mouth poses uh -huh. uh, in, in uh, audio files uh -huh. uh, it seems very uh, time saving um, is that something but it's it's complicated right so it is that is, something yeah. you made in-house, or is that...? Uh um, so, uh, partially, so we, I think it is a, a middleware tool that we've built a lot of our own tools on top of mm. to kind of help assist it. Like, I think it's called, like, I think it's just called Lip Sync. Like, the actual underlying analysis that it does for WAV files and text, like, I think we did, like, license a tool. But then the actual, like, the animation libraries and things like that, um, we wrote for, uh, like, you know, on top of it to mm -hmm. use. So our, our animators have an easier time setting it all up and things like that. I suppose we, we could probably write our own, but it's just, like, sometimes you look at middleware, like, is it worth spending the internal time for your program? Like, maybe your programmers are, would be really bored by that or something, you know? So just, like, it's a trade-off. Exactly. Middleware. I think uh, sometimes programmers uh, tend to be a little too uh, eager to, to do their own stuff from scratch, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Especially such complicated things as analyzing waveforms. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you should, you should encourage your programmers to realize how much work they actually have left because, like, just the work on the game is going to be so much that, like, it's, it might not be worth it for them. But if they're, if they're, like, super excited to do that stuff, maybe it's good. I don't yeah, know. sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, two more questions, guys, if there are any more. No, no more? All right. Oh, wait, one more. <coughs> Hi, again. Um, <laughs> Double Fine isn't really a huge studio. Uh, and what do you do if, you like, halfway through the process of recording voice dialogue, you realize that the actor is terrible or is... Uh, they just not write for the part. We usually just recast. Uh, we've we've, I think, had that problem like once, and we yeah, that's what we did. We just recast, and then sometimes it costs more, um, of course. But really, like, it's also important to have a good casting director. And uh, usually, what happens is that the casting director, like she, she, this particular casting director, Chris Brown, you actually saw her on the video with Tim when they were recording Pendleton Ward. She's been working with Tim since like Lucas Arts, and so like she knows what Tim likes, and she like really aims to please, and so she'll get you like the best actor possible or actors, and then she'll send um, audition tapes or files or whatever for to Tim, 
and he'll kind of pick out like you know who who might be really good and if there's still if he's uncertain like maybe he'll ask her to do some some additional lines or something like that um, but yeah you want to prevent that as soon as possible. you want to really prevent that before you go into the recording session if you can uh, do you usually like budget uh, accordingly for like if you have to replace an actor halfway through or uh, is it something that you yeah, pray I mean, won't happen? It's, uh, it usually doesn't happen often but you really definitely have, that's a really great comment actually, like you really have to um, like be, make sure that that doesn't happen to you because it can be very expensive and can really throw your dead, you know, your project off in terms of scheduling and, de and deadlines, certainly budgeting, uh, can be very expensive, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that's it. Thank you so much, you guys. <laughs>